Welcome to our continuing 2018 educational webinar series. I am Katherine Short, Partnership Marketing Specialist for FIRST Healthcare Compliance. At FIRST Healthcare Compliance, we help you with a comprehensive compliance management solution tailored to your business, a hospital, hospital network, healthcare practice of any size, billing company, or skilled nursing facility. As part of our complimentary educational webinar series, we bring you experts from around the country to discuss relevant topics in the healthcare industry. We are so pleased to have Will Simpson, Chief Operating Officer of Identelect Technologies, a publicly traded digital security company based in Orange County, California. William has over 10 years of experience in the digital security space. His focus has been around email security and its utilization in heavily regulated industries. As part of the innovation team comprising the Identelect Technology staff since its inception in 2011, William has a strong background in the particular space where security, technology, and business operational processes meet. Too often, there is a gap in communication and true cohesiveness between the IT side of businesses and the operational or compliance aspects inherent to today's digital world. William has hosted and continues to host numerous cybersecurity and compliance webinars for professionals in the medical, financial, and legal industries. His blended background of expertise allows him to take the complex topics of compliance and technology and percolate them down into easily understood, actionable information to ensure practices are able to, able to stay informed, technologically current, and operating within their individual regulatory requirements. A copy of the slide deck is available for download on the control panel. Feel free to submit questions in the question box on your control panel during the presentation. We will address questions at the conclusion of the presentation. Your Paycom CEU certificate will be emailed to you from Paycom following the broadcast. There is no need to request it. Additional CEU opportunities will be available to BC Advantage members following the live broadcast. See their website for details. Will, go ahead. Catherine, thank you so much for the great introduction and welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to be speaking to you again. Um, what we're covering today is sort of an extension of the part one of this series that we discussed uh, earlier. Uh, we will be elaborating on some, uh, some uh, similar topics, but going in a different direction. So if you have not uh, uh, had the opportunity to see part one, highly advise you check it out as it sort of gives a more complete feel for what we're talking about. So the topic of this session specifically is going to be going over primarily email communications, how they travel, where they're vulnerable, and different compliance considerations inherent to this medium. Um, I also want to touch on some mobile device utilization, different security best practices and considerations in our practices. Then we're gonna finish off with some social media understanding. It's a sort of an inherent part of uh, communications today. So it's important to make sure we're meet, meeting compliance and patient requ requirements and expectations, okay? So to start off with uh, email, it is here to stay. There has been a, a recent trend with a lot of uh, more technologically advanced practices where they're leveraging uh, client portals. And it's a great technology for, for patients to go ahead and access information 24 seven. It usually has a, a complete dossier on all the previous uh, um, different procedures and uh, interactions they've had with your entity. However, it does not provide a cohesive way to communicate with other practices, insurance carriers, and a lot of the other entities. So you'll find that email communication is a great unifying way of communicating between not only different entities, but also different uh, generational gaps. You know, we have uh, some of some people in the older generation uh, uh, leveraging email, but younger people, even though they're looking for these portals and technical ways of doing it, everyone is still accessing email as a primary method of communication. And as you can see from some of the stats on the screen here, it's a, it's still by, by and large, just a predominant way people are communicating. So it is something we need to make sure we're addressing. Um, so, when it comes to email communication, and I touched on this briefly in, the, in uh, session one, but to expand upon it, there, it's important to understand how email works because there is a basic misunderstanding of email in general, and it's hard to truly sign your name on the fact that your email is secure and compliant if you're not really sure where the vulnerabilities are. 
So uh, to start off, emails are not inherently secure. In their, in their general format, they're, they're a very insecure way of communicating um, with a lot of vulnerability points. That is not to dissuade usage, it is just a, a plain fact. So we need to layer security upon it. Um, it, and a lot of people are aware of, hey, it can be uh, breached, but also it can be modified so that the information can only be copied down, but it can be modified in transit. So that can uh, also have different legal repercussions there. So there's two different primary umbrellas or segments here where emails are vulnerable, and that is uh, in transit and at rest. Now, the at rest portion of this is something we touched on more on the session one. Um, it, it's easier to go ahead and facilitate. That's uh, your files on your computer, your files in your electronic record management system. Those are at rest. They're in a, a static system for the most part that you can layer security around, whether that's file walls, whether that's different uh, router settings, whatever the case may be, at rest is, is the easy one to tackle. The one we're going to focus on today is uh, in transit, which as we established is primarily in email communications. Um, and the, the way they're vulnerable is, is important to understand how email first travels. Uh, the graphic on the right here is, is a very, very simple explanation of how it travels, but it's to address the fact that when you're uh, sending from the top here, the sender icon, when you're sending a message, regardless of whether the person is sitting next to you or whether they're on the other side of the world, maybe in Australia, um, the internet and email by proxy associates basically like a, uh, um, a cohesive network where messages are bouncing around from different relay servers, just trying to find the quickest way to get from point A to point B. Now, at each one of these relay servers, um, it creates what is called a ghost image. A ghost image is uh, simply a, a copy of that that's retained on there for seven to 10 days. And the reason it does that is because when it's traversing the internet, trying to get from point A to point B, sometimes it'll hit a dead end. And in that case, rather than retrace in the steps, it can simply recall where it was previously and initiate from that copy. Um, but these servers, these ghost images are stored uh, non-securely. They're just basically like a photocopy of a postcard. So you want to make sure that that's where we're protecting this. Um, and important to note, actually, I'm going to go back here. There's multiple points of vulnerability, not just in this uh, center of the internet portion here, but in the segments between the sender and the internet and between the internet and the receiver. There's an important uh, distinction when uh, looking into different email security, email encryption, I mean. Um, there is what's termed server to server encryption, and there is end to end encryption. Server to server encryption basically means that once the message has hit this internet, this ether here, it will secure it and it will remain secure when in the internet. That means that the transportation between the sender and getting to the internet and leaving the internet to the receiver are unsecured gateway points. Um, so it is important to make sure that you, when utilizing email encryption, you want end to end. That means from the moment that the sender composes and hits secure send or encrypts that message in some fashion, before it ever hits the open internet, it is already an encrypted format, meaning it, uh, each one of these ghost images will just uh, go ahead and copy unintelligible data. Okay, so end to end is the takeaway from that one. Make sure that your email encryption is end to end. So I wanted to address some of the ways in which in transit they are vulnerable um, because a lot of people, uh, patients we deal with here uh, or uh, practices that we deal with here uh, ask me, well, you know, my, my practice is relatively small. I don't think my particular practice is being targeted by hackers. And for the most part, you'd be right. It is not a personal um personal topic, unless you're a large, juicy entity like uh, Anthem. The way that it happens is more ambient. So a common way that we, we briefly touched on previously was sniffers. Sniffers is a very simple way to compromise unsecured data in transit. Basically, it is a software that you can download off the dark web. Uh, it's not incredibly technologically challenging to uh, to wield, so it doesn't require a high level of sophistication. But they install it on different access points to the web, and uh, it's basically just filtering down copies of that information, any information that, that goes through this point. So some examples of where this is utilized is uh, unsecured Wi-Fi networks at airports, hotels and coffee shops. Why are these important? There is a lot of people that are going ahead and while they're waiting for their, their uh, airplane to land and, and take off for their flight in an hour, they're accessing their, their email, their bank account information, uh, a whole bunch of uh, personal information during these periods of time. And 
they're not really aware of the security risks involved in doing so. You always want to, want to make sure you're connecting to secure networks, but more importantly, encrypting those sensitive communications so that if your message happens to route through a compromised gateway, whether that's somewhere on the front end, like the airport or hotel, your coffee shop you're sitting at, or if it's one of the relay servers, which we have, we have no idea, we don't get to determine the workflow of an email. It's simply trying to find the quickest path. So. This is one of the primary th reasons we want to encrypt that message during transit. Um, next is key logging. Now we spoke about key logging and, and preventative measures in the previous one, but not really why it's important in regards to this workflow here. Um, key logging is a good example of where um, the at rest aspect of email communications comes into play. Um, we talked about in transit and needing security there, but the at rest portion is also equally important. So in regards to uh, um, how it is generally facilitated, there's a variety of different malware uh, ways of going ahead and compromising that information, but a common one uh, is in fact key logging. Now, the interesting part about key logging is it's actually really well designed. It was created by developers originally to go ahead and get feedback from users during a beta test. So let's say that I'm creating a new um, medical record management system and I have a user interface that I'm trying to find out how to tweak it to make it better. So key logging was uh, originally designed where I'd put that in the system and, and my beta users would go ahead and test it out and I can see, ah, I can see the majority of people uh, getting a bit lost when trying to navigate between these two screens. I can see because of the different key logging um, that uh, that is going on there. However, this uh, technology was uh, used for evil in the, in the way that cyber criminals uh, are leveraging this to go ahead and record every keystroke you make. Now, these types of uh, malware are, are a lot quieter than viruses. Um, and now, they don't generally have any obvious symptoms other than unwarranted transactions happening or people accessing your email account that you did not really realize or logins from different locations. The, the hard part about key logging is that even once you scrubbed it from your system, that doesn't mean that someone doesn't have your credentials or they're not being sold out there on the web. So if you even suspect key logging, you have to scrub your systems and do all sorts of security measures and, and, and remake all of your profiles. So it's a real pain, um, but also a very prevalent way to affect data at rest. So even if you're using email encryption, a lot of them will protect it during transit, but at rest is still the responsibility of the covered entity. And that uh, we expand upon in the previous section. So feel free to reference that information. Um, now, incorrect recipients. Everyone that I've ever encountered has had that uh oh moment, that feeling in your stomach 30 seconds after you hit that email and you're like, wait a minute, did I? No, that was the wrong Brian, wasn't it? <laughs> so it, it actually accounts for a lot more data breaches uh, per annum that uh, a lot of people can consider. A big one happened, I believe it was last year, where a large medical entity, I won't get into any brand names, an employee was sending a, an Excel spreadsheet with a, a list of a lot of the client information, patient information, sorry. Um, and they were trying to send it to, um, I believe it was one of their private email addresses to work at home but they got a digit wrong in the at gmail.com uh, extension on the email and then ended up sending this whole list of uh, uh, patient information to a mystery Gmail user. And there was a whole uh, uh, legal event surrounding this as they tried to uh, subpoena Google to say, hey, you need to go ahead and squash that, that email and verify that it was, it was deleted from existence. And Google was like, basically, well, you sent it out there, it's gone. And the, I don't believe any breach ended up happening. Luckily, I think it was a derelict um, uh, Gmail account. However, that doesn't negate the fact that it was in fact a breach of information and they still had to report on it and still had a whole bunch of fallout from it. So it's important to make sure that when you're implementing your email security tools, a lot of them come inherently with different control capabilities. It's not just as simple as, hey, yep, it encrypted the message. Um, if the information we're dealing with is sensitive enough that it requires encryption, logic would then follow that it does require some method of control, which is something that as a culture, we've just gotten used to giving up once we hit send on that email. So it's important to make sure we, we have those controls and we'll t dive into that a bit later. Now, um, breach notification. So there is a breach notification rule um, that covers covered entities as well as their business associates. And uh, in the event of a data breach or an email getting out, whether you sent it to the wrong person or whether there was a sniffer that got a hold of it or you had key logging software, all those things we just discussed, any breach of information has to be reported um, uh, within the first 60 days. And it's it can take a while to find this. Um, 
the unfortunate part is, is the further away from the event date that you get in your reporting, um, which oftentimes can take six months um, to go ahead and identify that there was a breach, because oftentimes they lay in wait and they are not sold and available to the public until later. Um, so it's important that the sooner you realize there's a breach, reported. Um, if, if you're waiting too long, not only can additional fines be imposed, but you'll be uh, usually at a higher tier of fine. There's four different categories there. So it's, it's important to be as proactive as possible and make sure you're doing those HIPAA risk assessments to see where the vulnerabilities are and to make sure you have different uh, security protocols in place to detect these kinds of threats. Um, so the importance of control. Um, the notification law really, really, I think, is a great way of highlighting the need for control in your email security solutions. Um, you want to make sure that when you send a, uh, an email out there, you want to be able to retract um, uh, an email once it's out there. If I sent the email to the wrong person, like in the previous slide, we had an example there, two different uh, bills, I think it was, um, you want to be able to retract that information. Um, one of the core concepts of HIPAA is to limit the access and sharing of information. And this is uh, represented in their three different safeguard uh, logic workflows and requirements that we'll get into momentarily. But any, regardless of whether it's email, whether it's hot, right, digital, physical, the limit of access and sharing of information is really the, the, the core focus of HIPAA. So when you're looking at different security measures, keep that in mind. Does this accomplish this? If so, you're headed the right direction. Um, so you want to make sure that if you, if you have email security in place, which I highly advise you do, you want to make sure that it also provides audit trails. So in, in, in addition to restricting unwanted actions, which can limit the access and sharing. So if I send an email out there, if I can restrict unwanted printing, forwarding, downloading, that means I can limit the scope of how far that email uh, can get out of control in the event that I sent it to a wrong person or even the correct person. It is my job as a steward of that information to go ahead and control the access and sharing. And so if you send an email to the wrong person, if you have the ability to one, check an audit trail, has it been viewed? No, it has not been viewed. Okay, step one cleared. Step two, can you retract that email? If so, if you can retract that email and show evidence via the audit trail that it was never viewed by the recipient, no breach took place. It's very important because it's very easy to happen. Whereas if you have these controls and you have this visibility through your security system, you can avoid a very nasty, nasty and public uh, exposure in the event of this happening, which let's be honest, we're sending hundreds of emails a day. It's just a matter of odds. Um, so uh, next up, I want to touch briefly on the three safeguards. I was alluding to this earlier. Um, when the during the OCR HIPAA audits and in any sort of a breach investigation, they want to take a look at your different safeguards. There's three main categories, the administrative, physical, and technical safeguards. Obviously, we're focusing on technical safeguards here, but you can see these are all in alignment with that core tenant of limit of access and sharing of information. So your physical ones are pretty obvious. Uh, you're probably already aware of those. Lock your file cabinets, give your keys only to the necessary management, uh, lock your front doors. Administrative, that's your business associate agreements, your trainings, uh, attending webinars such as this, for example. Um, and different workflows and HIPAA risk assessments. Um, but the technical ones, they want to make sure that you have policies and technology in place that can go ahead and have access controls. Who can see the sensitive content? Does everyone have the ability, like if you have a general uh, mailbox, uh, info at uh, dentalorganization.com. If people are sending PHI to a general mailbox um, that is then going to everyone in your organization, whether that's a small practice or a large practice, that is not limiting the sharing of access of information. That is a non-compliant way. You can't have an easy way to audit who saw that information, no way to limit the access control. So if you have a general mailbox like that, I highly advise you restrict the uh, mailing group to a very select few number of employees. Um, audit controls. Um, can you prove the security was utilized in your communications? Can you prove that only the intended party was, was privy to that information and that it never made it past that entity? So again, coming back to your security controls on your email encryption, if you have an audit trail and you can restrict printing, forwarding, downloading, you have done your due diligence to make sure you've restricted limited, uh, limited access and sharing of that information and you can prove it with a digital trail. And then, of course, transmission security, and we touched on this briefly earlier. Are your communications encrypted end to end? It's a very important aspect. You'll meet or uh, encounter a lot of entities, um, for instance, some email providers that will say, yep, we're HIPAA compliant. And a lot of people will take that 
um, at face value saying, oh, well, that means that they've, any email I send using this service is HIPAA compliant. And that's not necessarily true. A lot of them are saying that which is their responsibility, which, uh, which is the storing of emails is done in a HIPAA compliant manner. They're not necessarily saying that when you communicate to other email providers, meaning not their brand, that they're protecting that. So just because someone says they are HIPAA compliant does not mean they are providing every inherent tool um, for that compliance. It just means in, in the aspect that they provide, um, the hosting of that email, that aspect is compliant. So it's important to make sure that you have that outlined and get business associate agreements where applicable. Um, now, a common question that we encounter is regarding uh, retention policies. There is actually no HIPAA medical record retention policy requirement. This is actually one of the very few portions of HIPAA that is uh, uh, um, superseded by state regulatory requirements. Um, each state has their own different regulatory requirement regarding uh, retention of medical records specifically. A lot of them segment that outside of general business information. So make sure you go online and you look at the email retention uh, or medical record retention uh, policy of your particular state and uh, act accordingly. They vary. Some have a two year, six year, eight year. It, uh, every state is different, but make sure you're, you're adhering to it. Um, and uh, the, the covered entities and business associates are covered by those laws. So it's not just you, but it's any of the vendors you have business associates agreements with. They need to be made aware of that. And I would highly advise that you have that as part of your business associate uh, agreement uh, verbiage. Okay. Um, now, email retention policies in regards to compliance policies and procedures. HIPAA does have an opinion on this. Um, the, uh, there is a stipulation saying that uh, you must retain this document for a minimum of six years from when it was created. Um, now, oftentimes in practices, this is updated as the speed of technology moves quite quickly. Even if you've updated this, say three years ago, you updated a policy, you still need the previous iteration to be retained for that full six year period before uh, uh, going ahead and removing that. And I've uh, listed some examples of that. There's uh, privacy practices, a uh, big one here, risk assessment and risk, risk analysis. Um, for some that are not familiar, there is a requirement of uh, covered entities and business associates to do annual HIPAA risk assessments or analysis. Um, now, this can be a very um, daunting topic for those that are not familiar or, or uh, smaller practices that don't have a purely dedicated individual um, for a compliance officer, but someone who is rather wearing multiple hats. Um, there is a free tool online. Um, you can go ahead and Google HIPAA risk assessment tool, and I believe it's through the uh, HHS website that it links to this tool. It's a free tool, um, sort of like an install wizard that walks you through step by step. Here's what you need to do. Here's how you do it. Uh, do you have this policy and procedure documented? So um, there is some guidance on that, and I would recommend you go ahead and schedule that annually, have that well documented, as documentation is a huge part of the HIPAA audits, okay? Um, so when you're looking for email encryption, there's, there's a few key things to look for and a few things to be weary of. This is a, a space where technology has evolved a lot in the past few years. Now, keep in mind, email encryption itself has been around for decades. Uh, it, it's not a new technology. It's just gotten a lot more uh, intuitive recently. So if you've, uh, if you've been on the receiving side of an encrypted email, I'm assuming most of us have been on the sender side, but on the receiving side, this, this workflow will probably sound familiar to you. Um, the majority of email encryption solutions out there historically require that both the sender and receiver belong to the same system. Meaning if I have Acme email encryption and I send you a secure message, you have to either register, download or purchase Acme email encryption just to open that message or respond securely. This is a terming belonging to the same system. So while the, a lot of people have gotten used to the fact that that's just part of the cost of doing business. There are solutions out there which go ahead and do not have that process. So you wanna make sure that you have a simple recipient process. For those of us that have uh, uh, heard the squeaky wheel on that one, oftentimes a client will say, I don't remember my credentials. Can you resend that information? The more hurdles you're putting in between you and your patient, the more frustration and time is gonna get eaten for it. Um, next is a full feature set, and this is something we've been talking about previously in this in this session. You want to make sure you have full control abilities um, uh, that's not leaving your sensitive information vulnerable. That means you need to be able to, if you need to, restrict unwanted printing, forwarding, 
downloading or recall a sent message when sent securely. Now, there is a, an innate recall ability in Outlook for the first Outlook users here. Um, for those that have not used it, um, you're not missing out on much. Uh, basically what it does is that that recall ability that's native to a, a Outlook program specifically, it does not retract the message unless it, uh, the planets have aligned, meaning um, the message has only been sent internal on a, on a, a personally hosted exchange and it has not been opened. So it's very rare that this, the, these planets align. Typically what happens is if I try and retract a message that I've sent in Outlook, it'll send a follow-up email notification saying, hey, Will messed up and would like to retract this message but it doesn't actually retract it. So make sure your email security does in fact have that capability. Otherwise you're just sending out the red flag to say, hey, take a look. Um, you wanna make sure that also when you're implementing security, uh, as I said, it's been around for a while, but it can be quite clunky. There are many ways to facilitate email security and there's also a lot of different flavors. Uh, a key word to look out for in the white paper um, uh, credentials of an email security solution is NIST. Um, this is a government entity for standards and technology um, that goes ahead and vets different email encryption policies, workflows, and technologies. The reason this is important is because as there are many flavors, as technology evolves, so do cyber criminals. So a lot of historical encryption methods, which were very secure back in the day, are no longer very secure. I use an example of something that you may have seen in your day-to-day -day workings. Uh, PDF password protection is a form of encryption. What it'll do is it'll go ahead, and oftentimes it's freeware, um, it'll go ahead and encrypt a PDF attachment which is great if that's the only place where your PHI is, but that's a conversation for a different day. However, what the, the technology has not kept up with modern cyber criminals, and the specific way is password timeouts, which is a topic we delved into in a previous session, but in this scenario, think about this. If I uh, don't have a timeout on my passworded PDF, it's very simple to download a PDF password cracker and walk right into that email, or that attachment rather, within moments. So it's an example of how technology can get outdated. So rather than having to become a, a cybersecurity guru and understand the programming language of all of these, reference NIST, um, N-I-S-T. It's, it's a great way to know what is current, what is working, and what you should avoid. They do a great job of trying to take these hugely complex topics and, and narrow them down to digestible pieces. And you'll find that the HHS uh, literature and HIPAA compliance literature references them quite frequently. So the aspects of NIST that pertain to HIPAA compliance can be found quite readily on the HHS website. So please feel free to leverage that as a resource. Next, the simple sender process. Um, so something that we run into quite frequently is <laughs> human nature, it's hard to combat. Um, if you uh, put a bunch, if, if you're worried about security in your home, let's say you put a bunch of deadbolt locks and chain sliders on your front door because you're just, you're nervous about it, nervous about security, so you've amped up your security. If it takes 20 minutes to leave the, the, the house via the front door, what are your kids likely to do? They're likely to go out the back door because it's easier. Bye mom, bye dad. Same is uh, true, the same analogy can be, can be used when talking about email security or any security in a digital place in your work. If the process for your staff to utilize it is a pain, it is complex or requires a lot of different sign-ins, logons, passwords, or, or training every three weeks on how to use this new infrastructure, if it's complex, your staff will find ways around it. That is not to insult your staff or to say that a deviant in any way, it is human nature. Um, people like to find the path of least resistance to facilitate their job. So make sure the security that you're implementing is uh, minimally invasive to your staff. You want user-friendly interfaces. You want the least amount of touches required. If you can automate detection of PHI in your email communications, if it can automatically detect PHI and encrypt it, leverage it. That is an asset because then you'll realistically you need some one individual who is well versed on the different PHI requirements to make sure to nurture that dictionary and that automation process. And as long as that's dialed in, the other the other uh, pool of employees is sort of on autopilot in regards to encrypting the appropriate information. Uh, next, business associate agreements. This is a, a hot topic and I always like to bring it up in every one of my lectures as I find that a lot of people uh, um, don't, don't really understand the severity of it. Um, a question I get oftentimes is, do I need to execute a business associate agreement with my encryption provider? Absolutely, absolutely. Just because someone says they are HIPAA compliant, 
does not mean you need don't need to leverage a business associate agreement with them. Okay, that is the legally binding documentation saying yes, even though I am not a covered entity, since I'm doing business with you, the covered entity, I will hold myself to the same standards. An example of how this can 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 come back to bite you in the event that uh, it is not executed on. There's an example um, I like to reference that happened last year, April of last year. There was a small practice, I won't say the name again, avoiding any brand names, but a small practice, um, uh, uh, Midwest, I believe it was, that was in the middle of a HIPAA audit and they were doing really well. They had great evidence and documentation of their workflows on physical safeguards, um, administrative safeguards and technical safeguards, they had email encryption in place, hard drive encryption, they were doing fantastic. However, they failed to produce evidence for a signed business associate agreement with one of their vendors. This vendor was, I believe, uh, e-shredding, um, shredding and, sorry, archiving uh, for this company. So uh, they, even though the, the com uh, company they were working with was in fact HIPAA compliant, they just didn't have a signed business associate agreement. That ended up costing them $30,000 from that HIPAA audit. Let that sink in for a minute. There was no breach of information. There was no complaint. It was just a HIPAA order that noted, noted that they didn't have a business associate agreement with one of their vendors who peripherally touched PHI utilizing the technology in archiving those emails. So please, please, please make sure you are getting your business associate agreements. If you are interacting with a vendor who is unwilling or unable to provide a business associate agreement, that is a major red flag go find a different vendor. There are plenty of reputable uh, entities out there that are happy to sign a business associate agreements and the truly reputable ones already have their own version uh, uh, legally reviewed and ready to sign. Um, for those that uh, do not have their own business associate agreement that they, they opt for vendors like their IT people or anything, um, you can find a template of this um, on the HHS website. They've actually done a great job on that website. They're, they take very complex topics and give you a lot of easy free tools um, so feel free to check out that link there um, basically it has all the legalese you need and then in parentheses um, option a or option b depending on how your practice orients or if you're a business associate or a covered entity so the whole process shouldn't take you very long to go ahead and implement there it's, it's a great resource um, next, I want to talk about mobile devices, uh, mobile devices in the workplace specifically. Now, uh, BYOD policies. So there's there's always been an overlap of employees using their personal device for work. As you can see, 70% almost of employees are already using their personal device for work. Now, predominantly, the, what that means is they're piping their work emails to their device, but it could also mean research or an app related to some of the, the medical processes, whatever the case may be. But an actual policy, bring your own device policy, is 50% uh, of organizations in, in the United States are uh, uh, documenting this, actively saying, yes, you bring your own device and we'll provide XYZ security measures to make, your comp make sure you're compliant. So this is a security concern, um, but it can be mitigated. Um, but it's important to know the different threats involved. Um, to give you an idea of how vulnerable mobile devices are, there was 1.5 million new incidents of mobile malware in just the first quarter of 2017. That means unique different types of threats, brand new created. This gives you an idea of how quickly these are being generated. They're being generated 24 seven around the world by a lot of very creative individuals. Uh, and they're very hard to get, to, very hard to get your, your hands on them once they go ahead and facilitate whatever their agenda is. Is. To give you an idea, 20% of companies in 2017 experienced a mobile uh, device breach. That can be as simple as leaving your device somewhere and someone picked it up or getting malware on there. There's a variety of different ways. It's a very portable device. Um, and one of the main core philosophical issues with security is that the fact that app designers, um, app security is not yet high on their priority. It's user interface and ad space and the amount of ratings you get in the Play Store. That is their primary uh, uh, objective, not security, as evident by the egregious list of permissions that they ask you to give up when downloading those apps. Okay. Uh, so when it comes to security, uh, mobile devices are very easy to crack. Um, they, they do come with some security, but really you need to layer some security on it. The problem is that most users don't utilize basic protections. They want to use their phone. It's, it's, it's a device of immediacy, um, contacting immediately, finding information immediately. Hey Siri, how long do I need to bake this chicken for? Immediacy. Um, so a lot of people aren't necessarily wanting to slow down and make sure that the proper safeguards have been put in place. 
that includes updates. When your, <laughs> uh, when your phone has an update, people are even worse about this than on the computer. Uh, this scenario is probably pretty familiar to you. Uh, Windows security uh, would like to update and restart your computer. Would you like to do that now or snooze for three hours? <laughs> I guarantee the majority of people on this meeting have hit, uh, yeah, remind me again in four hours. And I guarantee I know what the answer was in four hours. <laughs> it's, it's a habit that we need to break as a culture. The security updates are hugely important. The majority of time these updates, whether they're on mobile or desktop, uh, to address the fact that on the previous slide, as we understand, 1.5 million new threats were created in just one quarter. These security updates are to combat this ever, uh, ever, ever evolving flow of malware that's being created. So when an update comes through, the longer you wait before implementing that update on your device, the more at risk you are. And once, once they have their roots in your system, very difficult to get out, okay? Uh, so it's important to understand um, the, the logic behind why mobile devices are targeted. Hackers develop malware to go specifically after heavily used platforms. Um, that is why you'll notice that the majority of malware for um, laptops and PCs is not directed at Macs, because historically Mac was not really utilized as pervasively in the workplace. Now that is shifting, and Mac has some excellent protections involved, um, but it's just a general concept understanding. The reason why hackers are now targeting mobile device smartphones is because they're now so capable of storing and transmitting all this sensitive information. There's over 2.1 billion smartphone users in 2017. That's an incredible number, and they're typically on one of two platforms, Android or iOS. That's only two small variations uh, that I have to code for if I'm trying to get my malware to speak and do a specific workflow on your device, okay? And now mobile, mobile devices typically can do far more damage than a computer. So think about this. You may not have all of your personal and professional contacts stored on your work email. Maybe you have all your professional contacts, but not your personal contacts. But on your mobile device, you probably have your personal email address the one you use when you sign up for things online that sends you junk mail. And then you also have your work email address. So maybe three different email addresses. Those are all uh, in one spot, easy to compromise. And also people know that what type of mobile apps you have on your phone. So if I'm designing mobile malware, one of the first things I'm gonna tell it to do is one, get all the contacts in the, in the contact book and send out a link to, to spread this virus and malware to get, to, to get its roots in deep to my network. Two, do you have any banking apps on your phone? It's gonna go through a list and see, ah, oh, you have the Wells Fargo app. Let's go ahead and put Roots down there. I can see, ah, oh, you also have a Bank of America app. We'll go ahead and put Roots in that as well. This is a very juicy target with a, with a, it's a central access point for so much data and with usually underrated protection on it, okay? So one of the ways to protect that um, that's very easy to implement and uh, remarkably effective um, at combating a lot of issues is mobile device management, uh, referred to as MDM. Now, there are a lot of different flavors of mobile device management, and it can get super complex and involved, depending on how large your practice is, that may make sense or not. But there are very basic ones, um, and the basic factors that you want from any MDM program is the ability to remotely locate a device, uh, to ensure it locks, to ensure that it, there is a password on the device of sufficient um, uh, capacity, not just a, a pattern that goes in a circle, maybe a seven digit password requiring uppercase and lowercase and symbols. Um, you can set different thresholds. You want the ability to block certain programs or block certain um, IP addresses, known malicious IP addresses that have viruses associated. You wanna be able to push that out to a device and you also want to be able to use this to wipe a device remotely. So an example of this, you pipe your work emails to your mobile device, uh, and then you uh, attend your uh, friend's bachelor party in Vegas that weekend, and somehow your device goes missing over the weekend. It happens, it falls out of your pocket in, in the restaurant, or whatever the case may be. Um, if you don't know where that device is, you, you have a ticking time bomb, uh, unless you can know for a fact it has been wiped and taken out of the equation. So very important to have these capabilities. Now, 
Oftentimes, these, these programs can be quite inexpensive or all the way up to incredibly expensive, but the truly good ones allow you to test drive them first. So take, check out the free trials uh, uh, and uh, leverage the tools if you're using uh, Google for Business. I believe they have a, a, a native MDM program that's uh, very easy to navigate in that as well. Um, there's some extra features. If you want to get a little bit more down into the rabbit hole on it, geofencing is a great tool to use. Geofencing, as you could probably tell by the root words there, is basically saying these policies should be enforced if X conditions are met geographically. So an example of that would be if I work in a cosmetic surgery clinic, uh, let's say I get a lot of high profile client, clients, I'm working in Beverly Hills, privacy is going to be a huge aspect, not just uh, due to HIPAA requirements, but also due, due to my uh, patient's expectations. A geofencing policy I might choose to utilize is when this device is within one mile of my workplace here, my address, the camera is disabled. That means that when your employees are at work, they can't take pictures of those clients because it's disabled the camera. Now, as soon as they go a mile away, that restriction is lifted. That's an example of one, one way of using geofencing. Another one is um, uh, email cannot be accessed if you are not in the continental United States. So if someone has tried to clone your device or is trying to access it remotely through, through a foreign entity, they can go ahead and prevent that as well. So it's very useful. It sounds rather techy and it can get quite techy, but you can see the practical applications are, are quite obvious. Um, kiosk mode, if a lot of uh, um, uh, fancy clinics may be utilizing uh, uh, mobile technology to go ahead and process payments, you can go ahead and enforce a policy that makes the device kiosk mode only, which disables basically everything except the payment transaction system. So if you're using that tablet to go ahead and facilitate any of that information, it is very limited in its uh, vulnerability points. And then obviously uh, app whitelisting and blocking. Uh, maybe you don't want people using Snapchat on the work device because it requires too many permissions um, and you want to block XYZ different features. And then data throttling. Um, an example of why you would want data throttling is twofold. One, if you're paying for any of your staff's phone and data plans, you don't really want them talking uh, on Skype for hours at a time off the Wi-Fi. Your bill will get very high. But also consider this. A lot of um, patient files are very large. Think about radiology images. Um, when you have these files, uh, if you have unlimited access to send information, no, no limit before it starts throttling, an employee could either um, purposefully or inadvertently send a large amount of information out there. If you have it throttle after, let's say, a gigabyte of data, you can limit the uh, amount of access uh, or exposure you have on that data. So there's there's definitely some use uh, use case scenarios where this would be applicable. Each practice varies, of course. Um, next up, we want to talk about uh, best practices here. Make sure you're updating or deleting unsupported or old apps. You'll see a little icon appear saying there are updates awaiting you in the Apple Play or the Google Play Store. Uh, make sure you listen to those. As we mentioned earlier, uh, those updates are typically security related. They may have some cosmetic changes, but most of them are related to security updates to address changing issues. And make sure that when you're in, in implementing MDM in your in your business, there's a, a correct workflow. Uh, people can get a bit sticky on this, especially when it's their own device and you're looking to put a, a in effect a monitoring program on it. So make sure you implement clear, well-defined policies. This is what we can see. This is what we can't see. This is what we can do. Meaning, we're not looking at your browser history when you're at home. We're not looking at uh, the the selfies that you took that you went that you, you didn't that you didn't look cute in that one. You deleted it. We're not looking at those. As a company, we are looking at your emails. We're making sure your security policies are up to date. We're making sure you have passwords up to date, things like that. Clearly define it or else uh, employees can get a bit sensitive about it and you're opening yourself up for issue. Make sure you get a signed acknowledgement and consent from your staff when implementing MDM on those devices. They need to opt in uh, and that should outline the, the protection limitations and scope. Um, then what I would do is make sure that the only people that have access to uh, monitor and or change those security policies have been trained and they are documented. You don't want to have multiple people uh, setting different rules for different folks. It's too many chefs in the kitchen. So underlined here, document, 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 absolutely imperative. Um, then last topic I want to start on here is social media. Uh, social media is 
incredibly useful. Um, it is also a bit dangerous, but in the medical space, it's actually far more per pervasive than a lot of uh, uh, practices may, may understand. Of course, social media is used by the majority of people on the internet. I think we all know that. However, the majority of people um, uh, do leverage social media to research doctors, hospitals, any medical provider. They'll look online. Why are they looking online? Generally twofold. One, they want to get an idea of who they're talking to, the culture of where they're going. Um, oftentimes medical uh, related items can be quite personal and they want to make sure they're doing uh, uh, they're in interacting with someone that is on a similar page as them and also what are other people saying if they look on social media and they look for abc dentistry and everyone is singing their praises online great i want to go see abc dentistry the opposite is also true um, so a lot of people <laughs> people love sharing their opinions and they will share their opinions on your practice on social media if you're not on social media to monitor this and do damage control or thank people um, for their positive reviews you're missing out and uh, it's uh, something you definitely want to get on top of an interesting stat I just wanted to include here also YouTube traffic to hospital sites has just seen an astronomical increase year over year 119 percent looking at uh, hospital uh, site YouTube sites and I have to believe the majority of those are not on the doctor pimple popper uh, for those that have the stomach I imagine a lot of the people in this room are familiar and maybe like that yeah, it's not for me but let's hope they're looking at other things on their on their YouTube page other than that <laughs> um, so some concerns when it comes to social media um, a lot of social media come with uh, inherent messenger systems like social media has a, a specific messenger these are not secure or compliant do not speak with patients on these messenger systems or through Instagram messaging um, you can post and have things publicly there but do not transmit PHI um, it is not secure uh, you do not have a business associate agreement executed with Facebook most likely <laughs> and your odds of accidental disclosure are very high um, also, something that uh, I thought was rather interesting, when you're creating a social media or you're just your website presence and you take a picture of your office, your reception, your lovely new fish tank you put in there and how welcoming and inviting it is, or the comfortable new chairs that you put in there, be careful you don't have a picture of one of your patients in there. One of the 18 PHI factors is uh, uh, imagery a picture of you. So there have been uh, incidents where entities have taken a picture for Google images uh, of the front of their building and they happen to catch one of their patients leaving. That is an issue. So make sure you, you have either only staff that are okay with it or nobody in the picture. Um, and then obviously this social media is social it is designed to connect the dots and put things of relevance together. So be careful of what uh, you and your staff vent on your Facebook or on your Twitter. If your Facebook profile says that you work at ABC Dentistry and you post, boy, man, I had a difficult day to day, uh, just some really difficult clients that just could not be pleased, that can get on the page of someone else that has subscribed to ABC Dentistry's Facebook that is linked to your Facebook profile that says you work there. These, these connection points uh, are definitely there. So make sure people lock down their privacy and be wary of what you say online, okay? <laughs> once, once it's out there, it's very difficult to quell. Uh, and the last aspect here, some best practices with social media. Um, when you're, you're, uh, uh, you have patients writing reviews, whether positive or negative, or talking about your practice, engage with them. If they say, oh, I had a bad experience, this is a great opportunity to say, I'm sorry you felt that way. How I would love to connect with you offline and see how we could best serve that. It's a great way of negating an angry, posturing uh, patient who is being very vocal online. Um, uh, and also a good thing to do is also uh, on medium such as Facebook, you can have people post things, but it requires your acceptance before it goes live. A very nifty setting. I would highly recommend you check. Um, and then make sure whoever has access to your um, uh, practices, Facebook or any social media page, make sure you have a dedicated administrator. You don't want multiple people uh, um, posting on there or posting across different platforms. You want to have a unified cultural voice is a term um, meaning you, you have a, a typical expected way that you frame things or uh, state things as well as types of articles you link to 
And on that topic, um, it's a great way to gain um, clout and, and, and patience is by being a source of actual education. People are coming to the doctor instead of WebMD because they want actual information. WebMD is going to tell you you have cancer. It doesn't matter what you put in. You probably have hep C and cancer, even if it's an infected toenail. <laughs> so people want accurate information. They come to trusted entities, such as covered entities, for that information. So this is a great opportunity to come back to this age of alternative facts and actually post um, uh, peer review documentation that, uh, on, on medical information that is actually legitimate. Um, so it's a great way to go ahead and uh, win over patients that way. And then something that a lot of practices I've encountered are actually averse to is uh, you leverage social media marketing this is a very inexpensive way to get in front of your target audience. Who is your target audience? You can limit your advertising to uh, geographic areas or s specific areas of interest in people's profiles um, or age groups. If you deal in primarily uh, children's dentistry, then you want to make sure, hey, let's target people in the area that have kids between the ages of, you know, one and seven, whatever the case may be. It, they're the great way to, to leverage that to uh, expand your practices uh, uh, reach. Okay, so I thank you very much for joining me. I know we covered quite a few topics here. I'd love to go ahead and field any questions at this time if we have any. Thank you, Will, so much. Uh, I appreciate that uh, webinar. It was very great. It had a lot of wonderful information. I know. Um, on social media, I've had on some of our um, other webinars, I know one interesting um, uh, point that came up also was uh, if you have uh, photos, like let's say it's Jenny's birthday, um, uh, make sure that you're taking a photo that you don't have, you know, like on a whiteboard behind, uh, you know, patient. Uh, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Check the background. <laughs> Yeah, that you not only don't have patients behind you, that, that you don't have patient information because that happens so often. You know, they're just trying to get a picture of, you know, Jenny's last day or Jenny's, uh, you know, birthday or whatever. And <laughs> it's fucking all over everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and once it's online, it's there forever. <laughs> because then somebody has a screenshot and mm -hmm. it goes on and on and on. So we did have some questions that came in. Um, the first one was, um, if you send a message to the wrong recipient, but it was encrypted, is it still a breach that requires record, uh, reporting? Excellent question. Um, and it's uh, it can be answered in, in the actual literal uh, um, terminology of HIPAA's requirement for encryption. Um, so there's different scenarios. Some, some encryption uh, protects it in transit, but then whomever is on the recipient side can open it. So you want to make sure that in this scenario, if you sent an email to the wrong person but it was encrypted, if they are able to decrypt the message, then yes, it is a breach of information you need to report it. However, if the system has some authentication requirements on the recipient to access, for example, uh, having them verify some piece of information prior to the decryption process that will prevent them from accessing it, and no, you would not have to report that. So what HIPAA dictates is as long as you have made it unintelligible to un to uh, non applicable parties, then you do not have to report the breach. So, I would highly advise that in your email encryption, most have this inherently, but not all of them, um, leverage authentication factors to make sure you can verify that yes, it was encrypted, and yes, I know for a fact it was Jim that opened that message because only Jim knew the answer to that question. So, good question. Okay. All right. All right, we have another one. It's, um, is sending PHI by fax more secure than email? This comes up a lot, actually. Um, a lot of people are peripherally aware of the topics we discussed here and how emails uh, are not inherently secure, and they take that to mean that email cannot be secure, so they go back to the tried and trusted fax. Um, fax is not compliant or secure. Fax is a very vulnerable way to send information, and you lose any of your audit and control capabilities, meaning if I send a fax, uh, someone says, oh, here's a fax number you can send that information to. I don't know if that's the local FedEx Kinko's. I don't know if that was in an isolated room. I don't know who is standing around. So the um, liability you're opening yourself up to and using fax is, is worse. I'd highly advise um, just finding a non-invasive, inexpensive email encryption and utilizing that as, as email is more secure, but it is more, uh, more importantly compliant and secure when leveraging simple encryption. 
Right, everybody standing around there is getting. Yeah, exactly. It'd be pretty embarrassing to be able to FedEx Kinkos learning about your your, your tests. <laughs> right. um, actually, speaking of speaking of Kinkos, um, what is what is the deal with uh, with copy machines? Because you know, copy machines have hold on to all the information, right? Is that is that correct? Absolutely. That that can be an an issue. Um, so any any fax machine copy machine does have its own RAM, uh, it, its internal memory, which does go ahead and hold on to that. Um, the majority of reputable uh, print companies uh, will go ahead and have a retention uh, wipeout on that, uh, meaning they get hundreds of different jobs you know, each day that they're printing and they only have X amount of memory. So typically they will go ahead and erase that. But what I would advise is if you are printing anything with PHI, Keep it on local uh, hardware. Um, you can leverage, you know, your presentation, like the P the PowerPoint we have here. I can go ahead and print that at Kinkos, but um, my email communications with some patients, I would not go ahead and do that, as you don't know who has access to that, and you haven't signed a business associate agreement with them. Great question. Well, so well, so um, when the when a company comes and and they have a contract with your with your practice, so then hmm? they have a business associate agreement with your practice. Is that correct? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So whenever you're utilizing a vendor that in any way that technology or process touches PHI, um, you need to exercise a business associate agreement with them. doesn't matter if they're actually looking at the information or if they're providing technology which houses, transmits, uh, shreds, whatever the case may be. If their technology or process touches client PHI, patient PHI, you want to make sure and get a business associate agreement. And then every time they update your your copier or whatever the case may be, then they wipe that clean and then they replace the the copier. Then yeah, exactly. Same same sort of logic. Same with with the shredding company. Whenever they have that, they'll go ahead and and, and go ahead remove that data after X amount of time and also house it appropriately with the correct correct technical safeguards. Interesting. Okay. Um, well, we had another question. So, is there a security difference between Android and iOS devices? That's a good question. Um, there is. Now, both can be made equally secure. However, there is a, uh, a logic difference between uh, iOS, the uh, Mac sort of side of things, and the Android side of things. Android leverages um, open source programming for a lot of applications, um, meaning that anyone that knows a bit of coding can go ahead and start developing an app and can get it up on the store. Um, there's not a hugely rigorous testing process. There are some safeguards, but I can go make an app and I can get it up on the store pretty easily. However, on the uh, iOS side of things, the Mac side of things, there is a far more rigorous testing process and very limited tools in, in which they let you play in their sandbox. So if I want to make an app for the uh, Apple Store, there's a lot more um, requirements and hoops I have to jump through. So I would say innately out of the box, iOS is less prone to uh, mobile malware. However, if leveraging the correct security and, and logic when utilizing a device, they can be made comparable. Great, great. Well, we really, really value um, your time and uh, uh, value your webinar here. Um, well, we, we thank you for coming and presenting this um, to our attendees. Attendees, we really thank you for, for coming and uh, viewing this as well. Uh, did you have any final thoughts for us here on this? No, thank you so much everyone for attending. Really appreciate it and uh, look forward to presenting to you again in the future. Okay, well, um, attendees, please use the contact information on the screen for any questions. Um, or if you send us any questions, we'll forward them on. My contact information, communications at firsthcc.com will be um, available um, after this screen closes. Uh, you can register for any future webinars or request a demo of our compliance solution on our website at firsthcc.com. You can also call us at 888-543-4778. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Have a good one.